What I shall do is draw on Festinger's classic account, When Prophecy Fails, published in 1956. And what I want to do is to start by making a distinction between prediction on the one hand and what we may call prophecy on the other. I think it's a distinction which is useful with respect to apocalyptic movements in general. And then I shall see how questions of gender play in and out of this distinction in Festinger's account. Um, I may say, as well as feeling tentative in talking in front of historians, I also feel tentative in talking on matters of gender and so on. But I think my observations will be fairly straightforward and relatively easy to comprehend. Now, I take the distinction between prophecy and prediction from an essay, The Voice of Prophecy, by Edwin Ardner. Prophecy pertains to what he calls the prophetic condition, which is a transitory social state in which certain underlying categories, categories which have hitherto permitted the making sense of novelties, cease to operate. So there is a, what we might call a collapse of social space, a partial collapse. I'll come back onto that in a moment. Some individuals have insight into this failure of what we might call second order categories, and they attempt to articulate the shift in the conditions of social space, and they may be called prophets. My argument is, my argument is that Mrs. Keach, the leader of a small group in the Chicago area, expecting the imminent arrival of flying saucers, was such a prophet. In her messages, which were given in the early 1950s, she referred to three kinds of contemporary technological inventions or scientific discoveries, which had resulted in a crisis of measurement, we might say. Of course, actually, it wasn't her, it was the aliens speaking through her that did this. But they were interested in nuclear weapons, in space flight, and in continental drift. Prior to these innovations, I would suggest, people had pretty secure dimensions for what constituted self-defense, distance, you know, a long distance would be all the way around the equator, as it were, and place. You know, we knew that places were fixed. Now, all three of those things had ceased to operate in the period. None of these taken-for-granted forms of measurement held any longer fully in making sense of the world and its events. And it is striking that they are, as it were, the, the material of the messages. They're what's being talked about in the messages that come. We, we won't go into the details, sadly, but they're there in the book. So there was temporarily acute uncertainty in the making of social representations. And in Ardner's terms, what we might call matters of measurement become problems of definition. You know, genuinely have to thought, all be rethought. So let me try to make this idea as clear as possible. With knowledge of the movement of continents, the extension of the dimensions of space linked to the possibilities of space travel, which hadn't yet happened, but was on the cards, and the threat of destroying self and nation in the processes of self-defense. All of these were novelties. Hitherto accepted notions of place, distance, and what we might call integrity became temporarily insecure and without definite content. Previously, one had known without reflection where one was, what a great distance consisted in, and who and what were the bounded selves who were the subjects of self-defense. But for a spell in the 1950s, these orders of measurement ceased to operate. And I emphasize, this is what the messages are talking about. You know, endlessly, they go on and on about. What, 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 you know, as it were, the fact that the only reason the flying saucers can come near and observe the Earth is because of disturbances in the atmosphere made by the explosion of atomic weapons in 1945. What is threatened is, as it were, the tipping of continents and the flooding of the Middle America, and so on and so forth. It's, um, it's really clear. So that's about prophecy. You know, she's talking about, as it were, certain things that are going on in the world at the moment. And I would, uh, anyway, yes. And, and, and then prediction, on the other hand, is rather different. It concerns simple statements about the future made on the assumption that the underlying categories are holding good. Predictions are made from within a stable definitional space. It's quite another kind of activity. Although it's easy to mistake acts of prophecy, which talk about the present and as well the problems it poses, to mistake them for erroneous examples of predictions of the future. 
If you don't realize that the underlying conditions for making sense have altered, you simply read over the claims of a world-changing moment regarding it as a mistake. And that indeed is the story of Festinger's book. He came upon a group gathered round a spirit medium and he assumed that Mrs. Keach was making predictions when she spoke about a coming concerning a threat of global catastrophe and the imminent arrival of flying saucers to rescue an elect group who would be trained out elsewhere in the universe and returned to Earth to lead the recovery of human civilization. A very standard sort of millennial narrative. He had every reason to make the mistake he did, I think, given the language used, which I hope we will touch on if I you know, don't go on too long. And a great deal has been written in the wake of his account. This was a very early account of a flying saucer cult in 1956. Flying saucers only started appearing in 1947. And Festinger was on the job early, and he has been enormously influential. And for the most part, the accounts that use him take his reading for granted, even though it presents certain anomalies. He is a major source for what we might call a flattened reading of apocalyptic movements. And what I'm proposing, of course, has been talked about in this conference before. I would mention particularly Joy Allen's notion of living in the light of the not yet. You know, that seemed to be quite a nice naming of it. And actually, Kathleen, Caitlin's, Car yes, Caitlin Carver's notion of disclosure rather than end time is quite clearly on the same sort of wavelength. So, I've been a bit rude about Festinger's account, and I am actually a great admirer of his book, which is a splendid book. The point about it is it is generative in a good sense. It offers such a detailed description of the material and such a clear analysis that it allows re-reading according to other lines of inquiry. And that is what I offered in an essay I published in 2013, and I'm drawing on that re-reading now. And I must say, as a teacher, what you search for endlessly is generative texts you can use in teaching. So, you know, this is, as it were, an advertisement for Festinger's wonderful book, which I may say is still in print. And I'm, if I'm still in print in 60 years' time, you know, I will be very pleased about that. <laughs> OK, so um, this is not... Thing. OK, so Festinger offers an account of an apocalyptic group then, and one striking feature of that account, I think, is the importance of gender differences. And this in a number of respects. I'm going to discuss three main points, and then I shall make two further minor points. And I will conclude, if time permits, but I may not go any further than that, with some compressed notes on why, where we might go from here. You know, as I sort of elaborated a bit. Now, the first remark is that the group gathered round the apocalyptic theme was organised by not one, but three women spirit mediums who both competed and collaborated with one another for the attention and loyalty of the group of seekers. And in so doing, it embodied, filled out, and gave credibility to the narrative as it was being created. These were the actors who produced, as it were, the story. Mrs. Keach proved to be an able person, capable of managing both the rather naive challenge to her authority, produced within the group by a member, Bertha Blatsky, who became a medium for the Creator, capital C, and also she coped with the more sophisticated alternative offered by a Mrs. Ella Lowell, <coughs> Lo yes, Lowell, an experienced medium operating outside the group who had been consulted by other members in the context of uncertainty created by Bertha's initial possession. These three women received messages, set the terms for the group, and disputed conditions and interpretations. Others could offer opinions, but their judgments, these women, carried the weight. In other instances, the medium can be male, I think particularly of Susan Palmer's work on Rael. But in this instance, the collective unit of production was female. That's the first remark. The second remark is that much of the story Festinger tells was the result of the play of outside interests on this nexus of female organised activity. And this outside interest was principally, we might say, masculine in form. The most notable part was a growing attention from the press. This attention to the group was attracted, both intentionally and unintentionally, through a particular man called Dr Armstrong in the account, a former medical missionary 
who had heard about Mrs. Keach through a flying saucer club. We don't have much material on flying saucer clubs. And who became her impresario and agent. Armstrong, early in this role, created two press releases, drawing attention to the messages Mrs. Keach was receiving, and it seems adding a date to the scenario they described, turning the narrative into a prediction, which is the story of the book, really. In the words of one critic on the internet, Alec Hiddle, Dr. Armstrong's effects on behalf of Mrs. Keach were rather akin to those of Ferber's Get Ready Man, who used to go about shouting at people through a megaphone to prepare for the end of the world. Now, this prediction precipitated a chain of events. It attracted the social scientists, who had a project on failed predictions, and who, finding a possible live instance, began infiltrating the group. Just a word of warning, please don't do this at home. It's actually considered to be deeply unethical behaviour. The fact of strangers appearing and showing interest in the business in hand in turn served to offer the group evidence that they were in reality involved in a matter of importance of which their spirit informants had knowledge. The members, new members' appearance served as independent confirmation. Further to that, the presence of strangers created the conditions in which first Bertha offered an alternative to Mrs. Keach's leadership, created disturbance, and then Mrs. Lowell was introduced by Dr. Armstrong effectively to arbitrate in the impasse which he had inadver inadvertently helped to create. One might see Armstrong as creating a gendered dynamic in his effort to assist Mrs. Keach. He was a scientist, a medical man with a history of involvement with men who had encountered flying saucers, something then in its infancy, some of whom had also been involved in far-right politics going back to the 1930s. Here the crucial name is that of William Dudley Pelly, um, and founder of the is it Silver Shirts or something? Yeah, it all sounds very P.G. Wodehouse, but um, <laughs> Pelly had spent the war years, you know, interned and so on. And, but he was then, while interned, I think, began being contacted by spirits and so on and so forth. Armstrong introduced a series of concerns which matched this background and training. He had an interest in prediction on the basis of stable measurements, and this linked to notions of anticipation as well as preparation for and control of future events. He was also keen to involve the wider public. Without his participation, it is unclear whether any kind of crisis would have been produced. You know, normally mediums just quietly go on <coughs> working with their group of comrades. And the crisis in the final instance was in fact precipitated by the press getting hold of the fact that Armstrong had lost his job at the local university because he was considered to be attempting to introduce his occult interests into his day job at a student's medical clinic. So a language of scientific facts, a belief in a politics of anticipation and control, and a commitment to a homogenous public sphere, you know, one where things were available to all people equally, might all be seen as markers of a masculine worldview in the period. My third remark concerns the social scientists, who in some ways replicated and developed Armstrong's perspectives. Not only did Armstrong's press statements serve to attract their attention, but he and his preoccupations provided both an entry point for their inquiries and a framework which matched theirs and perhaps obscured to an extent the activities of the women mediums. Festinger took Armstrong's concerns with prediction and the control of events to be the agenda of the group. If you read the detail, however, of his splendid book, it is possible to discern quite a different practice within the group, one of being tested and trained, so that responses to messages were made tentatively, with the possibilities being explored of learning new things, adapting to changing circumstances, and moreover, cooperating with the sources of the messages. In this perspective, Mrs. Keech's approach was open-ended and flexible, and, in her interpretation, ultimately successful, for the threatened catastrophe was averted by the attentiveness of the group. Festinger, however, read this adaptability as a post hoc attempt to escape the reality of failure, exposed within the stable framework he assumed to be operating. So, a simple conclusion, we might claim that there is, within the group's organisation and in its reception, a dynamic tension between prophecy on the one hand and prediction on the other, 
and that this tension may be mapped in many regards in terms of gender. I want to mention two other features relating to gender. The first is that all the spirits speaking through the mediums were male, at least as far as we know. Sananda, who was an avatar of Jesus, in the case of Mrs. Keach, the creator speaking through Mrs. Blatsky, and Mrs. Lowell's control was a Dr. Browning from the 17th chair of the seventh destiny in the spirit world, which is um, quite into your sort of occult world, you know, a bit of vocabulary there. In each of this each case, the messages gave the medium a male voice. And this feature has been commented on by other writers on spirits and gender, such as Browdy and Owen. And it allowed various tropes and tricks, including forms of public utterance that may be characteristically male in form, such as the manipulation of scientific terms, and there was plenty of that, and an ability to contradict other authorities and even to insult them, you know, what you might call robust public encounters particularly Mrs. Blatsky, who was really rather good fun, rather blunt in her approach, in the voice of the creator, of course. Now, we might also notice an aspect of spirit possession which has been commented on more widely. So, you know, works by <coughs> Lewis in the 1970s and Janice Boddy in the 1980s and 90s, where marginal figures, women in particular, gain both material goods and influence through their association with male spirits. A male voice is taken on and used to subvert the dominant structure in certain respects. It plays with what one, the Ardeners call elsewhere the muting of women's voices. And this playing with, as it were, the structural muting of women's voices may fit well with the notion of a collapse of aspects of structured social and intellectual space. You know, two things might go together. So that's, as it were, my first minor feature. The second feature to notice is how, in literary representations of women's spirit mediums, these active manipulations of gendered expectation are frequently neutralised. You know, we've got all these women mediums actually showing considerable <coughs> initiative and oomph, and actually that really doesn't appear in the novels and things that use this motif. For example, in The Bostonians, 1888, Henry James gives an account of the practices of public oratory by a female spiritualist in the 1880s. But he makes the medium Elvira beautiful, young and passive. She is a cipher to be captured by the dominant skeptical male journalist who loves her, and he takes her away from both the feminist circles in which he finds her and from the influence of her extremely dubious father who acts as her impresario. Carr, a writer on this sort of thing, refers to the figure of the maid and the magus in literature of this kind. Elvira simply transfers from the protection of one male figure to another against a background of women's interests. Perhaps surprisingly, Alison Lury deliberately adopted features of this model when she wrote a novel using Festinger's account. This is a rather nice novel called Imaginary Friends, published in 1967. Although Lury has fully understood the creative role the social scientists play in the unfolding drama. That's really the point of her exercise. I believe she was married for a short period to Festinger, so I don't know where in the marriage this fitted in, but she's really got the social scientist's role in creating what goes on very well. But the medium ha is still is a passive, vulnerable and attractive young woman, once more called Elvira, in homage to James. Just a sort of nod to the people who've read the odd novel. Elvira is denied all initiative and all effective intelligence. In particular, she is portrayed as believing a package of unbelievable notions about the reality of spirits and aliens, presumably out of a failure of critical intelligence. She holds to the predictive model. Yeah. Now, do I have time to go on further? I've got a sort of another page and a half or something to do. Okay, that's all right. Consent of the room, you're all happy about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody will stand up and denounce at this stage. <laughs> Right. Maybe later. <laughs> okay, so I mean that was as it were the, the, the meat of the project. Now, I think this kind of denial, which clearly has its gendered aspects, is one aspect of a wider failure to grasp what we might call the positive, gen positive agenda of the apocalypse. I don't have time to pursue this agenda in a brief presentation, but I will conclude by listing just some of the elements that we might need to take into account. 
you know, if we take this distinction with which I started seriously. If we start from the notion of a collapse of some aspects of social and definitional space, the failure of some hitherto secure second-order second categories of measurement against which novelties could be appraised, the prophetic utterance may be construed as a response to and recognition of this state of affairs. It's worth saying it may not be provoked by anxiety or grief or anything else. It may actually be a pr production out of desire and excitement. You know, it's why I'm very nervous about people saying, oh, yeah, it's fear of elimination, it's the First World War that does it, and so on. Actually, there's much more going on. There's much more positivity. These are the people taking control of as it were, aspects of the world they're in. This is an individual participating in a social condition that is, by definition, hard to map. This is hard to map both because it is a transitory state and because the appropriate language to map it does not yet exist. Indeed, the condition has to be spoken about largely in terms formed in the previous state of affairs, which then readily permits misunderstandings of the kind that we have found between the male certainties of Dr Armstrong and the social scientists, on the one hand, and the more tentative exploratory employments of language by the women mediums. Ardner talks about stretching of language under these conditions. We can analyse the two approaches, one in terms of what we might call a scientific approach, the other in terms of, say, metaphysical, something word like that, you know, following Albanese or Bender. And in my earlier essay, I drew attention to the different assumptions each party made concerning the work that language does and its powers. To give a summary in a sentence, different models of language are found in these two groups. The one, scientific, presuming language in principle to be a tool that describes a problematic, uh, unproblematic and stable world, ideally in a one-to-one -one mapping. You know, if, you, if you're the right sort of scientist, you can just get it right in the end. And the other, metaphysical, sees language as a far more idiosyncratic, context-dependent and, and active way of talking, so that words may have a power of their own to create or destroy. And both speaker and hearer must determine the intentions and potential of the other. Who is speaking to you? What are they up to? You know, what are you to make of what they're doing? So you've got to be more guided, and the world is a more divided and mobile one. And that distinction brings out many contrasts in the behaviour between the different parties. In particular, actually, their differences over attitudes concerning secrets and their attendant social forms. That's in the essay I published. And it allows a grasp of the kind of mutual misunderstandings that make up social encounters under these transitory conditions, or events, as we sometimes call them. Now, beyond that level of description, I have become convinced that while metaphysical accounts, in fact, bear witness to the characteristic features of the prophetic condition, rather better than do the so-called scientific accounts, so it's a rather strange reversal, and while their often hidden assumptions about the powers and nature of language correspond better with current anthropological interests than do those of positivistic accounts, we still have to pay attention both to the transitory nature of these moments and to their power to act as models shaping subsequent events. That is to say, even the metaphysical models sort of make an assumption that the world always works according to the rules that they're thinking about, which quite clearly doesn't work just as the scientists rather bluntly read over a whole lot of what's going on in the world because as it were, they don't notion the transitory nature where actually the categories aren't holding. So there are moments in the collapse of social categories when a range of linguistic features cease to operate, under which conditions, of course, we don't really know what the real does. The real may exhibit unusual properties, which cannot, of course, be verified unambiguously, and representations of any kind whether scientific, metaphysical or other, do not really hold. So we have a position where we're not sure what reality is doing. All accounts are going to be disputed and representation fails. This is not a good place to have worked yourself into as a research area. We, find, we need to find ways of talking about what we might call these unrepresentable moments in a fashion that does justice to them, and yet at the same time does not go so far as to render redundant the truths, feelings, and context with which we are more familiar. You know, a lot of the time, the language which, you know, we social scientists just at the moment are a bit snotty about, 
you, you know, actually works. You know, the positivistic scientific language is jolly good for describing whole stretches of what's going on in the, in the world and things. But the point is, there are certain areas where you have to pay attention, quite often temporary local ones, where actually other models are brought into play, you know, from previous times, which were like this. And, you, you know, we need to be exploring these. And these are really pretty crucial for the sort of topic that you're dealing in, you know, apocalyptic moments, millenarial movements and things like that. I will end on a theological note, which is appropriate for a workshop on millenarian movements. This problem has been named in theological language as a distinction between what's called kairos and chronos, between moments of judgment and time as a sequence, between, if you like, the eschaton and eternity. And we need to develop an appropriate sociological language, I think, that works on these things. My guess is that matters of gender difference will cease to hold under these particular sorts of conditions, and this has also been suggested from time to time in this conference, and it's certainly the case that St Paul thought so if you look at Galatians 3.28. But we do not need to follow that line of argument now. Thank you. Thank you for the paper. I'm sure there'll be some uh, questions on that material, so I'll open it up to the floor. Tristan? Yeah. Okay, thank you. It's really good. I have a strange question. Uh, you had mentioned at the beginning of your presentation, you'd, you'd cited both Joy and Katerina. Joy on the, I can't remember the term Joy, is it always, not yet? Or? Living between the now and the not yet. Living between now and the not yet, yeah. There's been a lot of literature and social theory about how we've restructured time in this sort of last decade and sort of really more future oriented. And then some other people have pushed back and said, well, no, we're actually living in the future perfect as though things already happened in the future. That's how we act now. And you know, a quick example would be bombing someone with, from a drone you know, that didn't actually commit a terrorist act yet, but as though they were already did. Um, this is Brian Nasumi who's, who's talking about this kind of preemption. And uh, it led me to think that among millennial movements, this is a crucial idea about their understanding of time, is about structuring the present as though the future already happened. Um, and it just, it's a weird existential question, but are we all millennialists now? Uh, <laughs> I think, I mean, all I'm doing, I think, is probably dealing from a certain sort of background and period of, of, of of a social approach, trying to give some sort of content to how you might talk about this sort of thing, and 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 therefore, you you know, you will notice is there's quite a sort of technical aspect to it. Um, I, I think um, I think the thing that I noticed for a long time, I was puzzled by the fact that metaphysical accounts had a lot more of the truth of the matter in than the scientific accounts. In particular. You know, what the scientists utterly miss is that they're actors in the game, and yet it's really clear in the Festinger book they actually make the events happen. Now, if you take a metaphysical account, you know that people are actors in the game. You know, it's already sort of built into the notions of language that they use and so on. So you're there and you're sort of thinking, well, what are we getting wrong? You know, why is it? It's not as if we wish to scrap scientific reality and stop taking antibiotics and, you know, <laughs> all this sort of thing. Um, and, and I think, it, it, in a way, um, I have been drawn, as it were, to what you might call the punctilia or event-based nature of the sort of thing that we're interested in. You know, at certain points, things happen, usually rather quite locally, you know, with, as it were, and, and they're constantly happening, you know, where new technological or scientific advances, or for that matter, changes in demography or, you know, all sorts of changes actually produce things whereby the ways we made sense and took for granted just aren't working anymore, and only a few people notice it. And so part of, you know, part of what Rael's doing is playing with notions of um, human identity through genes and things like that. You, you, you know, and, um, and there's endless stuff that's going on all the time. That's, um, you, you, you know, it's quite interesting that gene mapping has already, it's, I, I mean, that, that project has already collapsed and something else has come out where essentially what we're doing is manipulation of proteins. You know, it's really, it's really you, you know, even quite sort of technical subjects are continually being subjected to changes in, what for really 200 years or more we've taken to be sort of the base units of human nature, so sort of whether we call it physics or biology or, or whatever. So they generally come out in natural scientific terms, but one of the things natural scientists aren't very good at is noticing how shifting their terms are. 
So, w w in a way, the, my one reservation with the way you talk is whether or not it's got too stable an element in it. You know, whether as a, I mean, whether collectively we're all in a period where, uh, I mean, yeah. you, you, if you see what I mean, you, you, you know, I mean, Philip K. Dick, who, as it were, after all, st came in and said, you know, of course, once we get highly predictive notions of you know, individual responsibility through our genes or you know, through insurance systems, they're going to start picking people off. You know, you're going to become a terrorist. Let's get you out now before you do any damage. You know, this is, I mean, Philip K. Dick's actually done it, isn't it? I've forgotten what the name of the film is. That took, sorry? Is yes, it minority report? Yeah, minority, yes, yeah, and so on. I mean, you, you, you know, all, 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 all this stuff is worked. And, um, you, you know, it's quite interesting. I mean, there's a basis of a lot of, of policing is actually not doing that. Right. You know, it's following people, it's watching them and monitoring them. And indeed, I mean, a lot of um, warfare, actually, you know, whole rules under which British troops engage. This thing. You, cannot, you cannot engage with people who are planning to kill you. You can only do it when they try and do it. You, you know, so, so these things are there. So we're talking about, you, you know, I, I'm interested in events, as it were, and that's, that's the emphasis. Okay, that's good, sorry. Deal, and then Joy. Thank you very much. Um, so I like the plural usage of the term models of language and then the possibilities you know after that but don't you think that you foreclose some avenues already by encouraging us to take that approach because what about the model what I would consider a step be before that which is the models of models themselves um, I have in mind um, things like uh, the visual uh, the importance of the visual uh, as a, you know, in, along with the language. I have in mind things like uh, the importance of practice, which is also a very important part of the social anthropology project, uh, along with language. Um, don't you think that, that, possible, that at the level of method, that possible, those possibilities should be kept open as possible models of uh, modeling? I, th I, think, I think that, that you know, obviously that is going on in, in, in the discipline. It's quite an advance to start talking about you know, what are called language ideologies and things. You know, actually there's a lot, a lot going on in that area. But the notion that actually we have different ways of working in the world according to what we think language is doing is already a certain sort of step. And it's important if you're thinking, which a lot of the material, we're talking about reports. Okay, we're talking about reports of flying saucers. Things. Now that does include, you know, pictures on the internet of things whizzing around and so on. But, um, you, you know, so while, while I, I know what you're saying, I'm not sure that, that one should start worrying too much. I mean, it's certainly it's a, a local thing, but if you're dealing in reports, it's quite interesting to say, look, there's two ways of handling language, at least. Yeah. Can we go to Joy, and then last question. Thank you so much. That was really helpful. Um, for me particularly, because I'm looking at the nature of prophecy and qualitative research and, and one of the chapters in my thesis. Um, accepting what you say about prophecy and prediction, I have a question that I've been thinking about a lot recently, um, particularly within the ecclesiology and ethnography movement where I presented a while ago. Is there the potential, without reducing qualitative research down to something that it's not, for qualitative research itself to be prophetic within that way of looking at it, if we're using it as theologians? And, and how would one go about navigating the kind of potential power for qualitative research, speaking as a practical theologian for the church, without um, muddying the waters in a way that's unhelpful for either discipline? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're using prophecy in a slightly different way, aren't you? I mean, you're using, as it were, its creative potential. Yeah and things in a discipline. Um, I, I, I would just say two things. I mean, this is just, in, in a way, this is quite a small-scale technical argument, and it's not the case that actually they're mutually exclusive mm. things. It's just sort of bringing up the fact that actually something very different may be going on when somebody says, you know, there's going to be a catastrophe shortly, flying saucers have told us so, and um, they're watching us, and so on and so forth. That, 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 um, you know, there's all sorts of unanswered questions there, but I'm just really trying to pull out the business that prediction, which has had a long run, in this sort of area where everybody says, well, basically they're wrong. You know, it was all going to happen on the 21st of December 1953 and it didn't happen. And then there's total confusion. And the whole notion about cognitive dissonance, you know, if you actually read it in the light I've proposed, cognitive dissonance just isn't needed to talk about what's going on. That's quite interesting because it's had 50 years 
good run, and I'm not at all sure it represents anything going on in real people's heads. And it's quite significant, I mean, you, you know, sort of psychology rum subject. But um, so, so I, I, in a way, I, I, say, I mean, in order to handle this, you do have to say, look, this is just quite a small scale technical argument put forward, to, put forward by a social anthropologist, rather than sort of saying, you, 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 you know, can, can, can qualitative work actually sort of help change lives? <laughs> if you see what I mean, you know, actually make a difference to how we approach you know, social work or whatever. Is that, is that okay? <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay. oh, sorry. Um, I'm not. I don't quite have my question right yet. But it seems like this is obviously for the theme of the conference quite appropriate. But the prophecy and prediction focuses on time. But there are also these groups, both um, uh, the ones discussed by Fessinger and Rail, and I'm thinking of the Ethereum Society, also kind of open themselves up to criticism by making specific scientific metaphors in what they're doing, like the Ethereum Society has a prayer battery, um, which uses the latest technology to direct prayer to stop world wars. Um, which is, I mean, it's kind of predictable, it's kind of, but can you say something about the use of language and the way that the prophetic borrows scientific language or something, something about that? Yes. Um this is a big subject in a sense. My, my guess is that really much of the last 200 years, um, you know, new ideas have taken the form of, you know, trying to think in, in, in what you might call materialist categories. You know, essentially you're thinking, you know, basically science and technology are interesting. Of course, science and technology, I say, are much more mutable than we think. And there's lots of work now on technology, isn't it, which sort of says actually technology is improvisations with what is to hand, bricolage, in order to solve problems. And actually, once you've understood that, you've got a whole bit. There isn't a thing called technology which is changing our world. There's just sort of human intelligence doing extraordinarily new things. And in a way, I suspect I'm probably trying to apply that argument, you know, to, to human ethics, talking about scientific and so on discoveries. So people. People have always been looking to take what are sort of high prestige and intelligent forms of thought which, and put them to work and say, what's in it for us? And it starts, I mean, my story, you know, the story I'm interested in, starts with the uses of Newton's thinking. Once people started saying, look, Newton has shown that it's possible for bodies to have influence on each other at a distance instantly. You know, I go like, and you go, oh, you know, how is that possible? You know, well, it's perfectly possible, you know, we have it between the planets, we know about it, it's all been established, and off you go. Whole theories of healing, of influence, mental influence and things, all sort of start playing around with these ideas. And so I reckon in a way what we're doing is studying those forms of what I would call moral thinking with scientific discoveries or something like that. But the point about it, of course, is the scientific discoveries are themselves bound up in those forms of moral thinking, so it's not as if I had any sure ground to work with, which makes my... Life so difficult. So, really, see the prophecy is a form of moral thinking, then? Um, they're certainly, they're certainly very strongly. I think um, the prophecies involved are are, are most interesting because they involve, as it were, a judgment on the world. Quite often, a judgment on the groups. You know, and the, the flying saucer people come in and say, you know, you you are your warmongers. You're run by people that have all this technology that's setting things up. At the same time, it doesn't simply leave people with total destruction, it actually gathers a group together who have a vocation to serve more widely than themselves and actually offers them an opportunity and, and, and so on. And um, even though that vocation changes, so in the case they weren't actually needed to go off to the planet Clarion and be trained um, because, as it were, their faithful attention actually caused an alteration in the, in the conditions. So these are theodicies, I think I would say. I mean, I, think, I do think, but, but then, I mean, so... Uh, you know, scientific forms of thinking are theodicies too. That's again one of the one of the basic things. If you work in a university, you discover, you know, particularly people like biologists, they're just thoroughly decent people trying to make the world better. You, you, you know, if you, I mean, it's not the case that they all sit there thinking, well, yeah, yeah we, I mean, you know, you'll get the odd physicist who say, all I care about is the pursuit of truth. You know, <laughs> which is a rude word, and if we weren't being recorded, I'd say it. But, um, <laughs> but you know, nevertheless, actually. You, you, you know, they, they have their considerations. I've been in the room with meetings where all those questions about is it sensible to put out messages to attract other intelligences from other, mm. where, you know, really serious physicists have said, you know, actually thought about the consequences of their actions. And things. These are moral forms of thinking, and they're about, you know, how humans can live together well and what individuals' contributions are. 
And that's, I mean, I think an absolute key if you're dealing in small groups. People do see them as moral vocations with small groups of other people who've been called in order to share in a much wider benefit. You know, it's, it's entirely the fact that, you know, people are not being, for all the facts called, you know, evidence of age of individualism and things, you know, in the 1960s and 70s sociology, it's really, that really doesn't capture why people, you know, join the Moonies or join the Scientologists and so on, you know. Tim, I think we have to leave it there for now. That's Thank good. you so yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah.